I think I turned everything on. I think all the things are on. Okay, camera one, camera two, GoPro. Record audio recording. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Alex Fletcher. And I'm Rivki Silver. And this is Deep Meaningful Conversations, powered by Meaningful Minute. The podcast where we explore the complexities, nuances, and joys of being a Froom woman. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we are talking about developing resilience, one of my favorite topics. And the whole concept of resilience, I think, seems to have taken on new significance with COVID-19. Um, I guess not COVID-22. No, 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 COVID-22. <laughs> no, <I'm> just, <laughs> like it would ever imagine. I know 19 sounds very, very long ago. It does. But um, of course, like right when this whole thing started, everyone wanted to know how they could strengthen their resilience, coping mechanisms, you know, in face of this just new stress and upheaval that came into our lives that the pandemic brought about. Mm -hmm. So let's start by defining the terms. Resilience is the ability to bounce back in the face of adversity. It's really about how we respond to stress and upheaval. So the more we can build our resilience muscles, the better that we respond to stressful situations. Right, right. And, you know, as you're saying this, Rifki, I'm thinking about how resilience can really wax and wane in different life circumstances and different periods in our life, stages in our life, and also depending on different challenges. Like mm -hmm. there's some, I find, you know, some of my stressors I may have more resilience in, and then I like totally handle that one well. Yeah. And then there are other stressors that are more triggering for me. And I'm like, okay, fail. Like I really <laughs> need more resilience with that one. So one day I may feel resilient on one, you know, Nassayon and one challenge. And the same very day, I may totally not be feeling resilient. Totally. Yeah. And I, I think, um, you know, when resilient people, <laughs> what they're good why they're resilient and what they're good at is rising to the challenge of their struggle and of their pain. Mm -hmm. And um, actually reminds me a little bit of that like sink or swim metaphor. The resilience people are the ones that are swimming through it and the ones that are struggling in the resilience were sinking. Right. And there's, there's some of us who are just treading water. Oh, yeah. No, no. <laughs> Absolutely. We're, we're surviving. That's survival mode. Another another topic that was discussed a lot in the <laughs> pandemic. So... Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, we we talk, we use this, these terms. It was sort of like in the beginning of the pandemic. I don't know if you remember, like there was a lot, lot of articles. It was like either you're thriving or you're surviving, right? But you also could be treading, right? And I know? and I remember that, like that whole like dichotomy. You know, yeah. are you thriving? Are you surviving? And I mean, really, it's it's more complex than really the internet will ever allow it to be. Oh yeah. And I think that we we all want to build our resilience muscles. And the great news is that we can. Oh, yes. Resilience is not a fixed thing. It's evolving. And that's why we want this episode to be really practical and give you tools. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about. So um, we're going to get there. But first, <laughs> of course, um, I really want to expand this idea of resilience. Maybe it's that this is, we can say, emotional resilience. And I want to talk about spiritual resilience mm. because we're from, from right. women. Yes. Um, when I think about spiritual resilience and it's something I've thought about so many times and I never put a name to it actually until the past couple of years as we started talking more about resilience, but I see it as the ability to stay close to Hashem mm. during challenges mm. because it's so natural for us to be like, I'm struggling and then think, Hashem, you're giving me this major struggle and I'm going to pull back yeah. and I'm going to to further myself from Hashem. And that may translate into, I'm not going to be as careful in performing certain mitzvot. I'm not going to feel a sense of connection to Hashem. I'm going to yeah. turn away from him. Right. But, and, then, yeah. and then you're missing out on those amazing tools that are within Yiddishkeit to help build resilience. It's, yeah. But it's so normal. It's so and natural. It's so na and that's the problem. It's, it's, it's <laughs> such a challenge because that's what we feel naturally that we yeah. want to do. Yeah. Um, but... Spirit, I think spiritually resilient people turn to Hashem, not turn away from Hashem in those times. Right. And I, I've seen, and you've seen those amazing people that are dealing with horrific nisyonos. And it's like, they're, you could see that they're working on their amuna, That And then those people that you see actually inspiring other people, which boggles my mind. Yeah. Like, how are you surviving, strengthening your Yiddishkeit, your amuna, and also giving chizik to other people? Yeah, like, it's incredible. Wow. It's next level. Next level. It is next level. Next level. And I feel like, you know, 
that it's important to also note that we can't ever judge how someone is handling their person in the scion, very, right? We don't know. Very important. And what you were saying about how, like, you know, when people are in the public eye and dealing with an scion in the public eye, and yeah. you know, the, it reminds me of that. There's there's public nisianos and then there's private nisianos, and we don't always know what's going on in someone's life. Okay. So hold on, I actually, I wrote down some examples because I didn't want to forget. Yeah. Um, so, like, some public nisionos are, like, you know, like, Lolenu, like, a sick child, the untimely death of a loved one, mm. um, kids that are struggling, like, loss of income, like, you know, public loss of job. And all of those things can arouse, you know, compassion, you know, and... And, and support. And support, exactly. <laughs> and then the people rally around. You right. get meals. You get support. You, right. there's, and there's amazing organizations to support. But then there's also... More private nisionos, you know, like someone's, you know, mental health challenges, I think, mm. is, a, is one that is very relatable. Um, estrangement, mm. addiction, mm. abuse. And you're, you're keeping it quiet. Right. People and, don't know. Right. And it's, you know, yeah. sometimes people keep it quiet because, it, because of shame or because of wanting to keep up appearances. And that's, a, that's a, probably another podcast topic. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes people just don't want the whole world knowing what it's going through. It's painful. Yeah. But then and it's not helpful. And it's not helpful. <laughs> but then the fact of the matter is they're still going through you're still going through an asylum. And it still can be an incredible source of growth, but it can also be very lonely. Mm. And so, you know, we can't judge how someone's going through something. And also just I guess keep in mind if someone's acting a little off, mm-hmm. like you just don't know what's going on. Mm. You know? Yes. So Oh, it's a very, very important distinction. We're actually gonna be talking about this very, very topic of personal versus private nisionos. Um, now in this episode with Professor Leslie Gutman. Um, we are really, really honored to have her on. She actually yes. is a professor of applied developmental and health psychology at University College London. So she's joining us all the way from London on Zoom. Woo-hoo. So excited. <laughs> That's why I love Zoom. Um, it's, it's really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, so she's actually authored over 70 academic publications. Wow. And she has just come out, and Rifki, you have it. You can show I everyone. Hold on, let me get it. With her newest book, uh, Mosaic Oppressed, Resilience, A Jewish Guide to Facing Adversity, Fostering Strength, and Living Your Best Life. So we know that she is the perfect person on Normal from Women to have to talk about resilience. Yes, I'm very excited. But before our conversation with Professor Gutman, it's time for a montage. Our first montage of season two. I'm so excited. Yeah. We asked a few women to share a time in their life when they felt resilient. And this is what they said. I feel like there are many different definitions of what resilience could be but to me personally it's not about coming out of a traumatic event or an emergency situation you know with yourself intact it's more to me about the after effects resilience to me is about um doing the daily drudgery, the hard stuff, the stuff that you know that's right, but it's just so hard and you're just forcing yourself to continue to keep doing it. Like, for example, I started a new position um, where I was, uh, it was a leadership position where I was supervising people who were all a lot more experienced than me and they all knew it. (laughs) So every single day I would go in and I would be faced, you know, this, um, situation where I was telling people what to do or trying to lead them or guide them when they all knew more than I did. And so it was just every morning on my way to work, it was so hard. And I, like my inexperience was just kind of like on display for everybody else to see, you know, because like I was the one making the decisions and everyone else knew whether they were good decisions or not, you know, and I was learning, you know, because I was new. So every single day, I would just tell myself, you know more today than you did yesterday. Just keep going. You know, just keep going. Experience. The only way to gain experience is just to do it. You know, to be okay with not doing well and to be okay with all the areas you fall short. and Just keep going and just keep doing it. You know, and it took a while, a year or two, maybe more. Still, still going. <laughs> and, um, you know, but to me, that was... That was that to me, it's much harder to be resilient in situations of small challenge, small, consistent challenge than it is in moments of, um, you know, emergency or moments of like high drama. When I broke my ankle about eight years ago, I struggled with pain, surgeries and being unable to walk for weeks that turned into months. I found my resilience. I say I found it because we all have it. 
we just have to pull it out. At that time, I allowed myself to feel my feelings and even the negative and sad ones. But in order that I didn't stay stuck in poor me or hopelessness for too long periods, I had tools. What ultimately helped me bounce back each time I felt myself feeling low and down was writing, processing, sharing, playing music. And these things helped me feel positive, hopeful, and knowing that with Hashem's help, it will be good in the end. Looking back, I think that those techniques are useful in other parts of my life. I try to, I, I try to feel and name the feelings and move through them don't deny them, accept them, and try to keep your eye on the ball. That's what I tried to do, and it worked for me. Hey, it's Rivka Chilingu. So you ask a question, when do we feel most resilient? I don't have a specific moment. You know what I mean? There's not like a, I've so got this moment. But I think it's tied up in something else. I think my resilience has been tied up in like a self-confidence. And I have to say that when I hit middle age, let's just say middle age is like 40. When I hit 40, I'm 42, <laughs> 42 now. I just got this sense of like confidence. And I think it's not like, it's not an arrogance because I despise arrogance more than anything on this planet. It comes from a like, you just kind of stop caring more i never really cared much but you stop caring more and that get this you get this like confidence boost of like i can do this and i think that feeds into resiliency because you're like no i'm not going to let this beat me i'm i'm going to hang in there because i can hang in there i know i can hang in there I, I've accepted the social structure around me. I've accepted help from friends. I've learned how to ask for help. Something happens, man. Something really beautiful happens when you start getting wrinkles and gray hair. It's a great trade-off. I mean, I think people need to embrace that more, you know? But um, so yeah, if I'm gonna say something that gives me a moment that gave me resilience, was it tied in with that moment of self-confidence Middle age, baby. Middle age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, listening to those responses that we got, I just, first of all, I just love this segment so much. Yeah. I love hearing from all these women. They have so much to give and just all the different ways they give it. I think that, you know, when we're talking about resilience, I hear how like we're coming from a place of strength. And yeah. I think that's a beautiful thing to recognize. Like when we're feeling less than resilient, we can then think of the times that we've actually displayed strength and persevered. Like we can look back from whatever pit of despair we're hanging out in whenever we're like feeling so, oh, how am I going to do this? We can look back and say like, no, I did do it. Yes. I did do it. Um, and so it helps to tap into those memories and resources when we're struggling. And I think that one of the one of the ladies who she said that, the one who was the cheerleader for middle age, you know, um, she said, like, she looked back and said, no, I can do this because I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Such a great soul. And another thing I noted, I think with all three of our, our normal from women is the self-talk. Yeah. It's like we are our own best coaches. We're, you know, the first woman who struggled with, you know, showing up to work and needing to manage a team that was more senior than her and she would just tell herself affirmations mm -hmm. and positive self-talk to get her through and I like you said I can do this I've been there before I know you know I have the resources and such an important tool we should never under us excuse me we should never underestimate how much we actually can help ourselves absolutely absolutely and our mind is tremendously mm -hmm. powerful and mm -hmm. we should use it yeah we should use it <laughs> we should use it we are so grateful to have you on the show to share your expertise and resilience. I know we have a lot to cover, so let's jump right in. You've, you've just written a comprehensive book on resilience. It's right here. We have it. And okay. it blends both clin clinical research and tour insights to provide some much needed guidance. So let's start with defining what resilience is and what it's not. Yeah, that's such an important question. And I mean, there's a lot of misconceptions about what resilience is and what it isn't. And I wanna really focus on four kind of misconceptions about resilience. And I think the first one is that resilience, you know, a lot of people think resilience is about bouncing back or recovering quickly. 
And really, you know, I always think of bouncing back as one of those racket balls that you throw against the wall and it just comes back and it looks exactly the same. But, you know, really, you know, that's not this true for us humans. You know, when we experience hardship, it hurts us. And we also, you know, we don't stay the same, but we have the ability to learn and to grow and rebuild. And in this way, resilience really isn't about bouncing back into who we were before. It's about bouncing forward into who we can be, become. It's about actualizing our potential. I love that. The other kind of um, misconception about resilience is that it's about being invulnerable. But of course, you know, adversity hurts. You know, we can't forget our heartbreaks or dismiss our sorrows. And it's not about, you know, ignoring that pain or putting it in a compartment in our brain and not thinking about it anymore. What resilience really is about is about integrating our challenges into our new reality and creating a sense of oneness with ourselves. It's about adapting and becoming stronger in the face of adversity. It's about knowing that our trials, they don't, they haven't broken us. They've formed us into wiser and stronger people. And the other thing that I often hear a lot is that resilience is some, a personality trait, it's an attribute, but resilience isn't anything that we're born with. It's not something that some of us have and some of us don't fundamentally. Resilience is something that's made. And it's basically a set of skills that we develop and we learn over a whole lifetime. It's a journey. It's a journey that we take when we transform our setbacks into new opportunities and new pathways. And like a muscle, we have to continually work on our resilience so you know, we can effectively handle any challenge that comes our way. I think the last point is really that People think resilience is extraordinary, and it's not. I mean, we hear, we hear these stories or read these books of people that experience the most difficult hardship, and we think, you know, gosh, I could never do that. But, you know, here's the secret is that we all can. And that's what decades of resilience research has shown us. It's shown us that people really have the most astonishing resistance and recovery and resilience in face of the most difficult and traumatic adversities. And basically the human capacity to recover is just much far greater than we realize. You know, it's difficult, but we can all do it. Hmm. I don't know, I, as you're speaking and you're talking about the research that's done here, I mean, this is gold. I mean, we have certain, like you said, preconceptions, just, I don't know, based on what we think things mean. And it's like, wait a minute, this actually has been studied. We have learned you know, what resilience is, what it's not, and how we actually can make a difference and improve it. So I, I find it just like, a I find the social science is just so totally fascinating. It's just like a treasure chest waiting to be opened yes. of facts, how we can actually Im make improvements in our lives. Yeah, I mean, that's what I really wanted to do with this book. I mean, I have all this knowledge um, on psychology. I'm a behavioral science scientist as well. I do interventions. And I really wanted to have a book that combined to our to our wisdom, to our insights, with all this amazing evidence that we have, so that we're really using evidence-based strategies to, to mm -hmm. help improve our lives and help improve the lives of those we love. It's very, very exciting. Beautiful. Okay, so tell us, Tachlis, we want tips from you. We're going to take advantage of you on our podcast. <laughs> and share your wisdom with yep. all our listeners. <laughs> yep. Um, oh, I totally do this for personal reasons also. <laughs> <laughs> Free therapy. Okay, sorry. Um, tell me tips how we can boost our resilience. And I also think about, you know, we talked about this earlier in the episode, like there have, there have been times that we've built our resilience and like we can tap into and that can help us as well. You know, is that part of the, the equation, you know, relying on strengths that we've developed as well as looking forward and thinking of how we can create new tools to boost our, our resilience. So, so to give us a, a quick list of how we can get this done. Okay. Well, I don't know if that answer is really quick. There's a lot of good questions. <laughs> that. that is true. But, sorry. Um, yeah, no, I mean, in my book, I talk about kind of three sets of um, what I call strengths. And these are ways that research has shown that we can boost our resilience. Um, we actually call these protective factors because they protect us against the negative effects of adversity. Um, and one of those is personal strengths. And that's all, you know, our own beliefs, our own thinking patterns, our behaviors, our emotions, you know, how we deal with situations. And another important source of strength is our families. 
And the last is our external support system, not things like our friends, our community, and you know, even being in nature. So, um, and really these are things that build upon each other. And there are certain times in our lives where one kind of strength is important than another kind of strength. So, um, and that's really important to know, there's no magic bullet toward resilience. And I think the other question that you asked is, is also a really great one. And that is that, you know, in my book, just like my title, I have one section on facing adversity because when we're facing adversity, it's not really a time that we're gonna be, you know, uh, building up our resilience. It's a time that we're gonna be using all those resources that we've built up in the past. And we're trying to minimize, you know, what the negative effects. So on that section, I really focus on strategies that we can use right then and there to really help us so that, you know, to lessen the negative effects of whatever we're experiencing. And then I also have a big section on um, fostering strength because that's when, you know, we're just kind of going our normal daily lives. Of course, every day has some sort of struggle in it where <laughs> their lives are not struggle free. But um, that's when we can build up all those amazing resources, those amazing strengths that we can rely on later. And then actually another uh, chapter that I focus on um, is about post-traumatic growth. And that's after we experience adversity, we also see that a lot of people grow in, in ways that we didn't expect and their lives change. Um, and we call that thriving. So it's a different, different stages in our lives where we're experiencing different things. I just have a quick follow-up question. Sorry, Rifki. I know we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> Do, is this, does this growth happen subconsciously or um, do we have to like make specific efforts and intentions to achieve growth through the adversity? So are you talking about post-traumatic growth? Any type of going through a resilient, going, you know, being resilient through a struggle. Right. Like, like in the middle of the struggle, are you saying like in the middle of the struggle, do you have like a conscious thought? Right. Oh, this is something that could help. Is it helpful that in your, if you're in the middle of adversity, be like, this can help grow my resilience in the future, even though at that exact moment, it's not the time to do it. But is it helpful to have like a, even an awareness of it? Right. Or is it just happening on yeah. its own? Cause the mind is doing it on its own. I mean, I think when we're right in the middle of adversity, we're just like trying to survive. And right. I mean, that's why when I talk about adversity, I kind of give a roadmap of all the different emotions that we can experience and how to handle those emotions. And really it's about, you know, hunkering down, using those resources that we have um, and make not creating new changes and new challenges that, you know, <laughs> make everything worse, you know, because sometimes we, we tend to do that. We make big changes when, we're experiencing something really difficult. Uh, but, you know, it's after, it's in the aftermath that people really think, you know, you know, gosh, if this didn't happen, you know, I can see, I would never have done this. You know, I would never have, you know, gone this trajectory. I never would have met this person. I wouldn't have never had this re amazing relationship with Hashem or whatever it is, you know, we can see that there was this, this growth that happened afterwards. Great, beautiful. Um, you have written a number of articles for H.com, and there was a great article that you wrote uh, in 2020 on spiritual resilience, and we'll link to that in our show notes. So can you tell us a little bit about what does spiritual resilience mean and why is it important? Hmm. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I definitely wrote a few articles um, for H, and I also wrote one on resilience if people want to check that out. Um, but yeah, spiritual resilience, and I talk about this in my book as well, um, and I refer about existential beliefs, is really our, um, you know, our faith and our hope. Um, and it's also our religious practices, so the behaviors that we do. And it's also about having a higher purpose um, and, and the meaning that we make out of the struggles that we experience. And it's interesting because there's a lot of research showing that spirituality and religiosity are important um, to protect us during times of adversity across all religions. So I was just reading the other day, a really interesting finding that here in England, um, 18 to 30 year olds reported that they were attending more religious practices during COVID. So, you know, we can see wow. that this is, uh, this is a, a, you know, something that is protective across different different religions and different cultures. But I think for Judaism, you know, really all of our strengths are connected to our relationship with Hashem. They're all connected to a higher mission. So, um, so in a sense that for us, you know, there's less of a division because any way that we're improving ourselves, we're increasing our strengths is all about, you know, creating, um, you know, getting closer to Hashem and improving our relationship with him as well. 
Beautiful. So like our, basically our spiritual practices are kind of another layer of when you were talking about the different layers of protection, mm-hmm. protective, like communities, protective boundaries that can help uh, buffer us during times of adversity, like our, the strength of our connection to our own spiritual practice is like an additional benefit that we get just by being from women. We have like this additional protective layer that we have going for us when we, when we t- choose to tap into yeah. it, when we foster that relationship with Hashem. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's what really inspired me to write this book in the first place is just, I saw so many connections between the re- research on resilience and Judaism. And I thought that, you know, it really tapped into, it's like our own wisdom is already there. And it really taps into that. And I think you're hundred percent right. And there's a lot of research showing, you know, one of the personal strengths that um, I focus on in the book that really helps us with our resilience is emotion focused coping. And that's when, you know, we take all these difficult emotions that we're experiencing and we think, well, you know, what can I do with these emotions? How can I, um, you know, how do I handle that? And there's really two kinds of ways that we handle it. You know, one way is, is an active way and one's an avoidant way. So an avoidant way is when we do things like we're venting our emotions and uh, you know, letting them all out. And actually, you know, while we, we might think that's helpful, actually that's really hurtful because when we vent our negative emotions, our emotions build upon each other. And actually we find that, that in research that, that isn't very positive. So that's kind of an that's avoidant it. coping strategy. Whereas a positive emotion, uh, active, um, strategy that's shown to really be positive for our resilience is things like reframing. And that's when we take a situation that's really difficult and we see the positive side of it. And we see, you know, what's the, what's, what's the good that's going to come out about this? And, and, you know, or, or we can even reduce what's negative about it. So, you know, I give the example in the book, you know, if you're going through divorce, it might be, you know, that you have your opportunity to meet, you know, your true partner. Um, but if you're, you could also look at it and say, well, it's actually reducing all these negative, stressful life that I have because I'm not having this conflict anymore. Um, and actually what's so interesting is that research finds that people that are more connected to their religion, that are more spiritual, actually are better at reframing. So you're right. They all connect with each other. And of course we could sit and talk about all the other amazing things about our community that help us, you know, obviously what a big one is just having a supportive community and, you know, having people that we can rely on. That's such an important protective factor for us. Mm -hmm. Now this approach that you just shared with us, we have to make sure we're not getting into the murky waters of toxic positivity. Correct. When you talk about reframing, like we still acknowledge that we're feeling difficult feelings, but we're not having a whole emotion fest uh, like you, you said, like completely um, expressing them in an unproductive way. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, resilience isn't about, um, like I said, it's not about not acknowledging that this is a sad event, but not acknowledging that we always have to be happy. You know, it's about understanding why we're feeling this way. Our emotions are clues to what's happening in our life. And we have to accept our emotions and think about them and, and understand them. You know, why am I so upset about this? You know, why am I so angry? Usually when we have these emotions, there's a fear inside or a sadness that we have to look into and understand. You know, so it's about being reflective, but it's also about understanding that our emotions don't have to control us. You know, we can behave in ways that are positive and we can find positive outlet outlets for our emotions so that, you know, so that we don't have to kind of go down this cascade of negativity. Wow, this is good stuff. That's fantastic. Okay, we're gonna, I wish we had more time. We, we're just gonna end <laughs> with one more question. Um, we've talked about public nisyonos and private nisyonos that people aren't going to be privy to for many valid reasons. Um, how can we tap into this concept of resilience in dealing with the various nisyonos that we face in our lives? Yeah, I mean, that's such a great question. And I'm going to kind of say two kind of parallel things before I answer that. Um, But I just want to say that any kind of private struggle that anyone's experiencing, like, please do not make it entirely private. Like everybody Mm -hmm. needs someone that they can rely on, whether it's a best friend, whether it's your spouse, or whether it's a therapist. So, Mm -hmm. you know, please, if you're going through a private struggle, find some help. Um, And the other thing that I want to mention really with that is that a lot of times I think with a private struggle, one kind of um, challenge could that is is a feeling of shame. 
So sometimes we don't want to share what we're feeling because we're worried about shame. And I think what's so interesting, and I think your podcast does such a great job of that, is sort of normalizing struggles. You know, actually, you know, 50% of us are going to experience a mental health difficulty at some point in our life. And, you know, maybe that's a blur a little bit between the private and the public, but it also helps us understand, you know, we're not alone in our struggles. So I think, you know, if you are feeling shame about a private test that you're experiencing, it's really important to, um, to think of, work on your self-compassion. And self-compassion is about, you know, recognizing that my life isn't about perfection. My life is about learning and growing. I mean, that's why we're here on this earth, you know, is, is, is to become better. Um, and, you know, as humans, we, we make mistakes, we fall flat on our face, and that is just normal. So self-compassion is really just, it's not about liking yourself because who you are, it's about accepting yourself because of your intrinsic worth as a human being. And I talk about self-compassion and I give some ideas for and exercises for how you can boost that in, your book, in my book. Yeah, um, a lot and of I really think fantastic public, exercises in your book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I, I want to say something about that. And I think you know, just with resilience, you know, just reading anything, you have to really work on it. So if you read the book, you have to can go back and back to those exercises, because what we know from behavioral science is that we don't learn and grow just from, you know, knowing something. We have to actually experience it and practice it and, and do it. And that's really important for us. Um, should I say something quickly about public? Yeah, yeah, please, please do. Yeah, yes. yeah. So I guess um, my thought about the public was that um, is that really I think where the public struggle, what's really challenging, is um, receiving and, and and letting people know what help you need. And I think you know we're not really good at telling people, but it's really important that if we're going through, especially a public struggle, that we let you know we receive the other the help that people have to give us and. And that in itself is a mitzvah. And we tell people what kind of practical and emotional help that we need. And that's really important to our recovery. And of course, as a community, you know, it's it's so amazing that we're so giving and that we continue to give to the people that need. Hmm. Beautiful. Because we're all in that place at some point or the other. Yeah, that's true. We all have, we have times in our life when we're givers and times in life when we need to receive. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Own it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you so much, Professor Gutman. This was just so enlightening. Thank you for sharing all of your wisdom and your research and your experience um, with us. I know I have gained so much from this discussion. I'm sure Rufi has well. Same. And I'm just, I really honored to share this with our listeners, listeners today. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. Now it's time for this episode's takeaway. We're going to ask you the same question we asked the normal from women in the montage. What is a time in your life when you felt resilient? Mm -hmm. Think of that time and we want you actually to try to visualize it and tap into your memories and literally tap into those feelings if you can recall how it felt to feel resilient. We want you to practice doing this. Keeping in mind, these are going to be for the times when you're feeling, let's say, less than resilient. Now it's time for five questions with a normal from woman. Today's normal from woman is Chantal Modes, the mother of Bubby and Mora from Cleveland Heights, Ohio. If you could be any month in the Jewish year, which month which month would you be and why? Okay, well, that's a great first question for me because it's like super easy. Um, that would be the month of Tishrei, and I'll tell you why. Um, I was born in Tishrei during Aserah Simei Tshuva, and my husband was born on Yom Kippur. Our oldest child was born the day after Yom Kippur, and our first grandchild was born during Sukkot. Um, but aside from all these births and events, birthdays, which could be a little rough on our grandparents giving all those gifts, um, clearly the month of Tishrei has so many Yom and Tovim, more than any other month, uh, Rosh Hashanah, the new year, Aserah Simei Tshuva, followed with Yom Kippur. It's a very serious time. It's a very important time. And then right after that, we get to the Yom Tov of Sukkot, which my family really looks forward to. It's Zman Sim Chasenu. It's just the whole package. We love it, building the sukkah, um, the meals and the decorations and the food and the guests and being together. It's just, Baruch Hashem, you know, an amazing, amazing time. And uh, one more point, besides all these happenings during Tishrei, I think on a more organic level for me personally, 
um, is what Tishrei represents. I think in the zodiac calendar, the symbol of this month are the scales in Hebrew, Mosnaim, which represent mishpat and justice. And I think that's just a part of my personality. I've always very, for as long as I can remember, been very passionate about justice, justice of all kinds. I have like this really strong sense of right and wrong. So I think this month like really encapsulates who I am. What's your favorite mitzvah and why? Okay, um, I did think about this question a little bit. And at first it was sort of like, oh, how do you pick a favorite mitzvah? For me, it would be like picking a favorite flower. You know, each one is beautiful and you are in different moods. So you like different ones. But um, I think the thing that was just speaking to me when we say favorite mitzvah is perhaps perhaps a mitzvah that I think that I'm a little bit good at. Um, you know, we all have different strengths and uh, talents. And for one person, one mitzvah might be hard. And for someone else, you know, it's a breeze. Uh, some people struggle to make Pesach or to be an adult child and do kibbut of aim. Um, so I'm not saying that we shouldn't keep working on those mitzvahs that are more challenging, but I'm just going to pick one that comes more naturally to me. And that is the mitzvah of no se ba'ol chavero, um, carrying the burden of your friend. That's how it's literally translated. And I checked with my husband, is this indeed a mitzvah or just like a nice thing to do? And he said, no, it's a mitzvah. It's actually a chilek of chesed and v'alach drachav, imitating Hashem, who clearly is no se ba'ol with us. And he also pointed out that our leaders and Rosh Hashivas and Rabbanim are very busy with this mitzvah, taking out from their, you know, important schedules and, you know, their time to do this mitzvah. So it is a mitzvah. And sometimes being no se ba'ol chavero is helping your friend with a struggle. And I think there are some people that are really good at that part. Like when your friend has a problem, you're there, you show up. But having um, made a few simchas in like a short amount of time in the last couple of years, I was really touched and blown away how some people just really show up for your simcha. They come, it's not just the platter of cake or the candy tray, but a good friend is genuinely happy at your simcha and happy for you. And it taught me a lot, you know, how people expressed their joy at our simcha. And that's really what I try to do with other people to just show up, to be there. Whether it's a hardship, a hard time they're going through or um, being there for the happy times and, and being able to connect with them like that. So um, yeah, no se ba What do you do to recharge? Okay. Um, in general, I mean, it's a great question for women everywhere, I think, and everyone has their thing that um, helps them to recharge. But um, first off, I think I have to say that I'm not somebody that allows myself to get to empty. Um, I see a lot of people around me. Some people have a lot of people that they have to take care of, a lot of things that they do. They juggle a lot of balls. And for those people, it's like very quick to getting to empty and they better figure out how they're going to recharge. I don't do well if I get to that point, um, if I'm physically tired, if I'm emotionally tired. So I do different things throughout the day um, and throughout the week to, to help me kind of stay on an even keel. However, um, I do find a great benefit and it's super recharging for me is, is that in, um, connecting with good friends, um, Bar Hashem, I'm blessed with some amazing friends and I, I just learned so much from them. So it doesn't happen like super regularly, but I do make sure it happens on a semi-regular basis. It may be going out for lunch. Um, taking a trip somewhere, going for a walk, uh, a dinner date, or just connecting in some way for more than just five or 10 minutes. And like I was saying, I, I learned so much from them. We might just get together and laugh, you know, and that just feels great. Bounce off some ideas if I need to, you know, check in with somebody. I was thinking in a way, it's sort of like therapy. I think sometimes people use a professional in that way to, to bounce ideas off of them, to just do like this reality check. And when I walk away from that kind of an interaction with a good friend, I just, I feel great. I feel grounded. 
it's just, it's wonderful. That, that's how I recharge. What do you love about yourself? <laughs> that's such a cute question. Um, wow, uh, let me think. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm gonna pick something that I think just helps me a lot throughout, throughout my adult years. And I've heard it echoed in people that I work with, especially. Um, sometimes my principal will come and say, okay, I know you're going to be flexible about this and this, this schedule change, or I'm going to come to you last. And they'll, they'll refer to my sense of flexibility. So that means a lot of different things um, on a practical level, on an emotional level. But I think that life has so many ups and downs. Um, you know, what we expected out of one kid or what a, or a relationship or a community, things just don't always go as planned. And it can just totally derail us or we can just stay elastic, you know? Um, gosh, my life did not follow the script that I thought it would. And if I was not gonna change and grow and adapt to that, I would be in trouble. So I try to stay flexible. I try not to be too rigid. Um, I think it's just a really important mida just for a successful life. I'm not saying I'm perfect at it or I've mastered it, but it's something that I value in myself and in other people. And, you know, having a kid who went through Shaduch, I'm like, I was really looking for somebody that can stay flexible. Like, oh, you wanna go move out of town? okay, I think we can do that, you know? And I think that that really, it really just helps. And last question, what do you think the firm world needs more of? Wow, that's a great question. Um, something that I'm just like feeling lately and, and that is positivity, positivity. Um, I do a lot of reading online, the printed magazines. I talk to different people. I mean, let's face it, cholesterol is no different than any other um, any other group of people in that we have problems, you know? And guess what? We all know what those problems are. You and I, we could probably come up with like a long list of problems. Um, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't figure those out and talk about them and problem solve, and that's all great but never at the expense of our positivity. Um, we live in an amazing community. Um, we just look around us. We have like amazing neighbors. Our kids have super teachers. We've got incredible leaders and Rabbanim and Rebbitsons. And I mean, the list just goes on and on. We have to really stop and recognize that we are blessed with some amazing people. Are we going to see headlines that are disturbing and shocking? Yeah, but we just can't lose sight of the, 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 the people that we are and where we come from and the society we're raising our children in. We have to never lose sight of how lucky we are to really be here. Um, Rifki, I actually shared with you a few weeks ago um, this idea that I was trying to launch. I, I, I made some efforts and maybe I'll go back to it, but I was just blown away one day when I realized we do need more positivity. Um, I came up with a little slogan. It's not super original. Just say it. You know, if the Shaytamacha did a great job, call her, text her, say, hey, my Shaytam looks terrific. Your contractor did, you know, you're happy with the job you did. Don't just call him when something breaks or malfunctions, say, hey, this, this bathroom looks super. My kitchen, I just love it. Tell the, the teacher that you love the Parsha project that came home. People just feel so good. Um, you just don't know the impact of that positivity. And I'm gonna keep it short here, but I, I shared with somebody recently that I was so impressed with the way she handled a certain situation and her professionalism she practically broke down crying. She couldn't believe that there was no but at the end of the sentence, that it, literally, she told me, you didn't just make my day, you made my week. So that's when, that's when I ended up calling you, like shortly thereafter, after that conversation. Imagine that we would make people feel good. Um, they would go home to their spouses a little happier, a little less stressed. So this concept of positivity could be small, it could be global, it could be whatever you want it to be, um, and just, one last point about that, I, I read that there was a certain family who had a very um, seriously ill 
relative in the family. And you know, sometimes you read people want you to um, be careful on Shmir Salashon or do this or do that, having their family member in mind. And this person said, think of something to thank Hashem for and have us in mind, which was kind of like original. But I'll wrap up this concept of positivity that kind of overlaps with Hakar Satov, I think. Because if you're truly Makir Tov, you recognize the good that you have, you're going to be more positive. And I think that we, we beg Hashem for things and we have to keep begging him, send us that refua, send that shidduch for somebody, et cetera, et cetera. Just don't forget, always thank him for the good. I, I don't know what the order is supposed to be. I guess you follow the way our sitter works. You know, Shmanestri starts with, with this, it actually ends with modim. But the point is, throughout the day, of course we ask Hashem for stuff, but wow, this went right and that went right and thank you and my kid's doing great with this and this teacher and don't ever stop. Well, you know, the, the attitude of gratitude, I think that's what can also bring us to positivity if, if we're having a hard time with it. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Alex and I would really appreciate it if you would take the time to rate and review our podcast. All the links and references we made in the episode can be found in the episode notes. And don't forget to check out our podcast on the Meaningful Minute app. Yep. And if you're on social media, of course, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram, a little bit on Twitter, um, where you'll find some extra content from us at Deep Meaningful Conversations. Finally, a big thank you to the Meaningful Minute team for all the behind the scenes work they do to make Deep Meaningful Conversations happen. Absolutely. Thank you. And we will see you all next episode.